Professor? Yeah. When we are dealing with the uh, uh, the straight capita, yeah, we are straight capita. I can't hear you, Sam. Go ahead. When we are inserting the straight catheter, is infection not a concern? Straight catheter, you hold it in place. What was the other answer related to infection? The medical the medical, Med medical asepsis is is putting it in like with just regular gloves. It's surgical asepsis. Okay. Yeah, medical, everybody recognize the difference between those two things. Medical is every day, I'm just putting on a regular pair of gloves and I'm doing a procedure. Surgical is when I put a Foley catheter in, I'm putting sterile gloves on. So that's why medical was not. Miss Anderson. Miss Anderson. Yeah. On the summative packet answer key, where it has the um, the Addison's and Cushing's fill in, uh -huh. where it says susceptible to infections and poor wound healing, it just has Cushing's. Addison's is going to be more susceptible to infections. Cushing's is going to be one of your biggest concerns with Addison's. Cushing's will have a high sugar. I mean, yeah, anybody's susceptible to infection, but I think Addison's is more susceptible to infection. Okay, because it says susceptibility to infections yeah. slash poor wound healing. So, again, I don't care. I'll give you the point. It's not about the point, right? It's about us right. recognizing what we can do. Addison's is high potassium, low blood sugar, low blood pressure, susceptible to infection. Yep. That's the things that we're going to look for. Okay. Pushing high blood sugar, high blood pressure with the point of the face, the buffalo hump. That's what we're looking for for that one. So we'll be, so I'll, be, I'll come right back in. Okay. 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 Is this the same thing you mean by one thing? So at least I can swear. Yeah. Okay. You're going to take it. Immune disorders. All right, here's your first point of immune disorders. What does autoimmune even mean? Let's start there. Your body destroys normal things and attacks itself. So things are no longer working properly. That's what an immune disorder is. Somebody tell me some different types of autoimmune 
diseases. HIV, HIV is viral. Lupus, diabetes, lupus. Lupus, autoimmune, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes type 1, diabetes is fetus. It's not HIV, that's a viral infection. ALS is considered possibly autoimmune, but many times at ALS we don't know the cause. Do you remember us saying we don't always know the cause? Right. It sometimes is in the category where it potentially could be an autoimmune process. So what triggers the autoimmune processes to happen in our body? Stress, viruses, infection, viruses, right? These are triggers that then make our body start to attack itself. Ah. So here's, auto, here's autoimmune. We can be triggered by outside toxins. What does that mean? Chemo, medication, certain drugs can make us then develop autoimmune disorders. So we don't always just live with lupus and have it forever. It could be triggered by something that happened in our life. It could be triggered by stress, infection, illness, toxins. So our autoimmune disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus erythematosus, right? That's the long name for it. Um, psoriasis, autoimmune. Asthma. So, do you remember us talking about Raynaud's phenomenon where you get the fingertips that are blue and, and it kind of, comes and goes and you tell them to stay out of the cold, that's autoimmune. So we gotta recognize what we'll all go into this category. So if we have an autoimmune disorder, what's happening? Our body is basically attacking itself and things don't work like they normally should be working, right? So now what kind of symptoms are we gonna have? Well, it depends on what autoimmune disease we have and that'll determine what symptoms. Many times, People with autoimmune, if you see a question about rheumatoid arthritis and uh, lupus and things that we just talked about, what am I going to pick? It's gonna, what is a DMAR drug? Methotrexate, you remember us talking about that medication. That could be autoimmune treatment. Steroids, yeah. autoimmune treatment. Pick those. That's what you want to pick, steroids. So pick the prednisone or the cyanidrol or the methylprednisone. That's going to help the patient with autoimmune. So try to find something in your answer that has something to do with that. What do we know first about our immune system back from the beginning? Okay, so what's, what's our responses? White blood cells. Go back to what we learned way back when we learned infection control. They're basically the inflammatory response in our body. So if you're going to get questions about leukopenia or neutropenia, what are our precautions? We got to start with how do we, what do we know our numbers are. So in order for us to say somebody has leukopenia, their number is usually less than 4,000. What's normal white blood cell count? Five to 10,000. It's a number should stick in our head when we leave here, right? You got to remember that number. If we say the patient has leukocytosis, what do they have? A high white blood cell count. So why does somebody have a low count? Well, they have an autoimmune disorder. Could be a drug that's created in leukopenia. There's certain medications that we give patients that make them have a low white count. What kind of medication for cancer makes us have a low white count? Chemotherapy. Your biggest concern, the biggest complication of cancer and chemotherapy is infection because they don't have white blood cells to fight off infection anymore. You and I, if we got stuff rates today for labs, what would our white blood cell count be? 7,000, 8,000, 9,000. Aren't we exposed to bacteria every day? Yes, our white blood cells come along and get rid of the bacteria. No one walks around in a sterile environment. We touch things, we eat things. But when we don't have a high enough white blood cell count, that's when we get infected. So leukopenia is basically low white blood cell count. What else about where, where are these cells made? In the bone marrow. So what if somebody has bone marrow cancer or bone cancer? Don't you think they're going to be leukopenia? Mm -hmm. Because they can't make them. What else are they going to do? They're going to be anemic because they don't make red blood cells. Remember, we got to go back to the basics of where are these things made? And I'm just trying to help us remember 
what these numbers mean. What does neutropenia mean? Specifically, the neutrophil count is low. What do the neutrophils do? What's the purpose? So the first line of defense from our white blood cells, they come and get rid of bacteria. If they're low, it might not give you a white blood cell count, it might give you a neutropenic count or a neutrophil count. Less than 2,000 for neutrophils means they need to be on neutropenic precautions. Okay, what does that even mean? Well, there, go back to what we know. No fresh fruits and vegetables in the room. Limit visitors, right? Monitor for signs of infection. Frequent hand washing. Remember all those neutropenic precautions. That's the neutrophils when they're less than 2,000. And again, this is all in chapter 74. It's not information that I'm making up. It's all right here in front of you. So you got to make notes for the next test and go back to what we know about all these different numbers that we're looking at. So we restrict visitors. Anybody that's infected, should they be coming in that patient's room? No. Fresh fruits and vegetables? No. You want cooked fruits and vegetables. Um, again, your frequent hand washing, any of these things. What about injections that we might be doing? Let's say I need to do sub Q or IM or any kind of injection. Would I want to limit how many things I'm putting into this patient's body? So could one of my answers be limit injections or limit putting in a Foley catheter? Think about a different way of uh, measuring urine, right? Doesn't that make sense? The less I put in this patient's body, the less likely they're gonna get infected. So there's our neutropenic precautions, uh, less than 2,000. What do our neutrophils do or what do they increase with? When would we see an increase in our neutrophils? Infection. Why would we see the neutrophil count go up? The patient has a bacterial infection. Because isn't this what they do? So if we know that they have pneumonia and it's a bacterial pneumonia and we get a CDC, we might see that their neutrophil count is extremely high. Would we expect that? Be high? Yes. High not that if they're going to go in the body, right? Um, what about trauma? Would you think that would make our numbers go up? Yeah. Or down? Up or down? Up. up. Wouldn't it make our white blood cell count go up? What's happening? Inflammation. Isn't our body responding to what's happened on the outside of us? So now we see these numbers go up. So you have to recognize what makes them go up, what makes them go down, and when it would be expected to be up or be down. What if the patient um, has sepsis and their body's not keeping up with the infection? Where do you think the neutrophil or the white count's gonna go? It might initially start up, but then where does it go? Down. What happens with sepsis? Your body is no longer keeping up with the bacteria that's all circulating around. So initially you'll have a high white blood cell count because the infection just started. By the time the patient's septic, what do we see happen? The blood pressure goes down, the, the patient goes into shock, the white blood cell counts go down. That's how we know sepsis is happening. The body can't keep up with it anymore. So everything is not being produced the right way. What else can make our white blood cell count go down? Patient getting radiation, that can make it go down. So you just have to recognize what are normal numbers, what kind of precautions am I going to have this person on if it's too high or too low? And then move on from there. Do you remember us talking about uh, all these precautions before, back in the fall, restricting visitors, restricting, restricting, restricting live plants, no fresh fruits and vegetables. Why do I want to avoid rectal temperatures? Bleeding. 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 But more importantly, couldn't I perforate the rectum and create an infection there that the patient probably can't now fight off. So any, again, anything that we can do to, to limit us putting anything foreign into this patient's body because they can't fight off infection. That's neutropenic precautions. So an absolute neutrophil count is called an ANC. You might see that as part of your CDC differential. Remember I said we can get a CDC, but a doctor might order it with differential. All that really means is now we can see the neutrophils, the eosinophils, the basophils, all the different parts. So an absolute neutrophil count of less than a thousand means that you have to have neutrophil precautions. And again, 
When does it increase? When does it decrease? We just talked about. If we see a, a question that talks about our T cells or our B cells, what are they, what are they high or low? They're part of our immune response, right? So when would they be increased? Well, if we have a bacterial infection, we're gonna expect those numbers to go up. What kind of patient might have a low T cell or B cell count, HIV? That's one of the patients and that's how we can tell how, how bad is your HIV? Are you actively in the, in the diagnosis of AIDS? Get your T cell count. And when it's low, we know that your body is not keeping up with the virus that's in your body. What about leukemia? Low T cell count. What do we know about leukemic patients? It's a cancer of blood cells. That's what leukemia is. Can they fight off infection? No. So that's one of the biggest complications with your leukemic patient is infection. Allergy testing is just talked about here, how you kind of prepare the patient. And if anybody who's ever had allergy testing, again, you're just looking for a little bit of fluid under the skin and basically part of our immune system to tell us what you should be allergic to and then we decide how to continue. Immunizations. What's the difference between active, natural immunity, and then we're going to give you artificial immunity? What is active, natural immunity? That is all of us right now who have had COVID. What does your body do? It creates your own immune response. If you had chickenpox as a child, you then have immunity to chickenpox. What if I never had chickenpox? Now you get the varicella vaccine, and now look what I had active natural immunity that's the difference so now i'm gonna i'm gonna make antibodies in response to the covid vaccine i'm gonna get in my arm today yes i'm yes i'm going so i now have my own active immunity still but again what are we hearing now how long does that last well 90 days does anybody really know for sure no but what are we now going to do with the vaccine produce active natural immunity okay so here it is it's right in chapter 75 these are the chapters that are going to be on the next test what do i mean by passive immunity what could be a form of passive immunity when another human or animal and uh, what am i talking about what about when a mom transfers immunity to her baby that she's carrying she might have immunity that she can transfer over through the through the fetal blood mixing that happens Again, this is a forms of passive immunity. Uh, and we're, you know, again, it's usually a temporary passive. Active natural immunity is what we're trying to get with these COVID vaccines that everybody's getting. So here's our recommendations. And again, it's hard to remember all these. Those of us who like numbers and like to memorize, these are things that could be easily memorized. Again, when do we get a TDAC or a booster for tetanus? Every 10 years. That's what's recommended. What do we say about a burn patient? Well, we don't wait and find out, okay, do you think it's been seven years, sir? Okay, no. The patient's burnt, we're just going to give them a tetanus. Right? We're going to go ahead and give it anyway. What if you had one two years ago and I give you one now? Is anything crazy going to happen? No. The worst thing is that I don't give it to you. So now they, they get it, but that's our recommended every 10 years. Does everybody run and stick their arm out every 10 years? No. Most people don't. If your story said the patient was exposed to metal or stepped on a nail or stepped on something like that, pick tetanus. That's what you're going to want to give them. Even if you don't know when their last one was, or even if they tell you, I think it was four or five years ago. Okay, well, we're giving you another one just to be sure. MMR, one to two doses until we're sure that we have confirmed immunity. Patients born before 1957 are considered to be immune, but again, the further we get out from that age. So MMR, when is that given in infancy most of the time? If people follow the proper schedule. We'll talk about schedule of vaccines for infants when we get to these next month. Varicella, two doses for those who are not immune. So varicella is a two-part shot injection or vaccine, whatever you want to call it. One key thing with varicella, anybody pregnant should not get the vaccine. Why? Because it's a live vaccine. And so then what could potentially happen, the baby could develop varicella. And then the baby can have what you might see written as teratogenic effects. What that means, the baby is affected and usually not in a good way. 
Lots of times it's harm, very harmful to the baby. So varicella should not be given while the mom's pregnant. Can the, can the pregnant mom get a flu shot? Yes. Yeah. Can the pregnant mom get a COVID shot? No one really knows yet. Some people are, some people are waiting because I don't think there's enough literature out there yet to know whether they should or shouldn't get it. Flu has been around so they know influenza is safe to get when you're pregnant. Now, what if somebody in the story says if they had a reaction to the flu vaccine three or four years ago, would they be re recommended to get it? No, anytime they have a reaction, anytime somebody has an acute febrile illness, what does that mean? Well, you have a fever right now and the fever is 101, 102, no vaccines. Because your body doesn't know what it's fighting off and it doesn't know how to develop that immunity if you have a fever when you're getting a vaccine. So that's one of the contraindications for a vaccine. Pneumococcal, age 65 or older, that's when we recommend it. Hepatitis A, two doses. How is hepatitis A spread? Fecal, oral, oral, meaning you're going to eat or drink contaminated food or touch it or get it into your mouth. So here's a vaccine that can prevent that. Hepatitis B has a vaccine that's blood and body fluid. C does not have a vaccine, so don't pick that. It doesn't have a vaccine available. HPV, what is that? Three doses, here's your patients up to age 26. What are we preventing with HPV, cervical yes, cancer? Is it recommended for male patients? Yes. yes, because they could potentially transfer to the female who then is gonna develop the cervical cancer. It's not the guy that's gonna get the cancer, it's the female patient that's gonna get it. Meningococcal polysaccharide vaccine. Oh my gosh, what is that? That is to prevent men meningococcal meningitis. We talked about that before. Who's giving that private observation? To a, how old was the patient? Pediatrician. So dose for students up to age 21. So pediatric, lots of times in the adolescent years, we're going to recommend you get this vaccine to prevent you from developing meningitis because you're around more people, you're you know, around your peers, you're getting ready to go to college, you're going to be in the dorm, you know, basically, so you do not get meningococcal meningitis. Military should receive that. Why? They're around a lot of people in closed quarters. College students, prison people, around a lot of people in closed quarters. Uh, again, revaccinate every five years of high risk. So again, don't administer live vaccines to people that have those immunocompromised disorders. Because what's a live vaccine mean that the body? Yeah. Can the virus is actually live and active and it can create more problems than it does good. Okay. Again, let me know. Can they get the vaccines? Yes. Yeah. What we're looking for is have you had a fever? Uh, and severe fever illness is again a contraindication. Risk versus benefits. Some people really believe in vaccines. Other people say, hey, my kid's never getting them. But there's there, everybody makes their own decision. Again, a, American Pediatric Association is going to recommend vaccines for kids. There's always a, baby, um, like a, a girl at the office where I went to, she was 19 and she was just getting the age. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, up to age 26. Maybe she never had, I mean, it's recommended at 12 to 14, but again, don't stay in that tunnel vision right. up I to age 26. And, and you just saw it like, hey, she's yeah. just getting here. Yeah, but maybe she never had around. access to health care. Maybe, maybe right, it hasn't been around forever, mm -hmm. right? I never got it. I never, oh, I, I never knew to get it, you know, when I was 12, 13, or 14. It hasn't been around forever. I just thought it was fine. Right. And again, medicine changes and they figured out that people with cervical cancer have a, have shown to have a higher likelihood of that virus in their body. So then they figured out, okay, let's create a vaccine. So it hasn't been around forever. All right. So Tdap, there's your tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis. That's what it stands for. You can't give it to a person that recently had Guillain Barre. Again, we know what Guillain Barre is, and most people will know what they've had recently, right? So that, that's one of the questions you can ask them. Influenza, same thing. People don't get the influenza shot if they've had Guillain Barre. What about what else about influenza? If they're allergic to eggs, we don't give it to them. A few of the vaccines, like HPV, don't give if they're already if they're pregnant. So they're 15 year old, but pregnant, they can't get it. It's a live virus. If they're allergic to latex, so something in latex is similar to something that's in that HPV virus uh, vaccine, so they shouldn't get it. So these are questions that you're asking. 
patients. Are you, you have a hypersensitivity to latex? Have you ever had an allergic reaction? Isn't that a question that they're asking them before they get the COVID vaccine? You ever had an allergic reaction to any vaccine before? Um, many times we ask people are allergic to latex. And if you are, then we, some of the vaccines you can't get because you're probably going to be more likely to react. Allergic to eggs or neomycin. What's neomycin and antibiotic? Varicella cannot give a previous transfusion within the last 11 months because if you had a blood transfusion, you have uh, antibodies that have now been in your bloodstream that for whatever reason you react to the varicella virus and because it is a lot virus, more likely to have problems. You don't give it to people that are pregnant. You don't give varicella to immunocompromised patients. That might be a question that you see come up. Why? Because it's a live virus. What am I doing if I'm giving vaccines? Well, I better be aware that somebody might have a reaction to it. So what should I have available? Epi, epinephrine, right? I should be, I should know that at any time I'm giving you something. It, it's funny, like today, I'll go get my, my vaccine. They'll say, sit here for 15 minutes. What did I tell you happened the last time? They put me in the hallway. I never saw anybody. I don't know what the purpose of the 15 minutes is because if I don't see you for 20 minutes, how do you know if I'm breathing or not? I would be dead by now, right? Over down to parking lot. And nobody would be nobody's there. there. Nobody's there. Really nobody's there. Yeah. So when is it most likely to happen for any kind of reaction? Usually 15 to 30 minutes. Aren't we at the VA and some people that are high risk are making stay for 30 minutes? Yes, really? and then they're doing that, right? Because we should be monitoring that. Okay, we're gonna give them uh, information. Do we have side effects from these vaccines that we're giving people? Yes. What are the side effects? Sore arm, you might feel a little achy. You might have a little bit of a headache. You might feel a little tired. That's a normal side effect that's expected. Can you take an antipyretic? What does that mean? Tylenol? Yes, you can for fever, full compress. Uh, and then what are we documenting when we give a vaccine? Well, we document the date, the time, the lot number off the vaccine vial. Why do we want to know that? Because if you have a reaction, we want to know what lots did it come from, who made it, how many people had a reaction to this particular type of virus? Like you, that's what has to be documented. You guys, when you had your vaccines all come with the you know, lot number that they use. Well, where are we going? Deltoid muscle almost always it's IM. And that's how basically the vaccines. So this is just a question. The nursing review and strategy is to promote comfort with the client who received an immunization. What should we include? Select all that apply. Do we want to massage the inject injection site? No. Can we apply a cool compress? Yes. Should we tell that patient to keep moving and using their arm the rest of the day? Yes. yes. Why? Because we went there for the next three days, right? Move your arm around, so that's okay. Can we take acetaminophen or ibuprofen? Yes. yes. Tylenol or Motrin, that's what ibuprofen is. Use the affected extremity. Yes. yes. What did I just say? Use it. Yes. Move it. Apply an antimicrobial ointment to the injection no, site. No. 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 A nurse is preparing to document administration of a meningococcal vaccine to a client. What do we want to include in the documentation? The age of the client receiving it, the name of the vaccine. I think this should be a select all of them. Name a vaccine manufacturer, vaccine expiration date, the date of administration, the serial number. So what we're including, the name of the manufacturer, yes. So is it Pfizer, is it Moderna, is it whoever makes it? Do we put the expiration date down? Yes. Yeah. yes. Do we put the date of administration down? Yes. Yeah. What about the serial number? No, we put the lot number. That's why that was wrong. That should be a sub -dollar. A nurse in the clinic care for client is receive an immunization. The client asks about contraindications to immunization. Which of the following responses should the nurse take? The use of insulin is a contraindication. No. Is that a contraindication to getting any vaccine? No. no. An anaphylactic reaction is a contraindication for administration of any type of immunization. Yes. The common cold is a contraindication. No. no. The provider will what will weigh the risk if you have experienced any adverse effects. Uh, 
So what's our best answer? An anaphylactic reaction is a contraindication for administration of any type of immunization. Yes. The answer in the book is to use blood. No. Why is it not big? So what it's saying is if you had a reaction before to the varicella vaccine, does that mean that I'm never going to give you an influenza vaccine? No. Steward any? That's the word that throws that off. If it said an anaphylactic reaction to this vaccine I'm giving you happened before, wouldn't I say hold it? I'm not going to give it to you again. So it doesn't mean any type of vaccine can't give, can't be given. What's our best answer? The provider will outweigh the risks versus the benefits. That's our best answer for that question. Okay, HIV. Human immunodeficiency virus. Now in the in the early, and I won't go much longer, I promise. Savers, okay, HIV. In the 80s and 90s, when I first graduated from nursing school, HIV was like the talk, right? Nobody wanted to take care of anybody that had AIDS. Nobody wanted to take care of the patient that was positive for HIV. All the, the talk of universal precautions came out. Um, you know, basically they decided we should have been doing these precautions for everybody and anybody. So that's what universal precautions mean. You kind of assume that every patient you take care of has HIV, right? You basically take, assume that blood and body fluids are infected with HIV because you never, never know, right? That's what universal precautions mean. So I remember like, you know, no one wanted to be assigned to these patients, but then we all started thinking, well, shouldn't we be doing the same stuff every single day with every patient we take care of? Trust me when I tell you, the people that had HIV, I took care of a 65-year-old man that I thought, okay, you know, I'm just going to empty his urine, no big deal. I'm not worried about it. But then when I knew they had HIV, wasn't I more precautious? Yes. And I should have been at just as precautious with the person with, that was 65. Because guess what? Then I found out three days later, he had HIV. So you just never know who has it. The person does not always look sick. They used A lot of those HIV patients used to be sick. They used to get a lot of cancers. They would get called Kaposi sarcoma. That's a lung cancer that they get. And many times... HIV didn't kill them, but it was their immune system being down and they would get other infections and that's what they would die from. So again, with all the treatments now that we have, do we hear about HIV and AIDS as much as we did before? No. Do people still have it? Yes. But their viral count, basically they get a count of the virus in their body is much lower with all these new meds that, that you know, have been created now since the AIDS. Where is it? It's found in any body fluid. So feces, urine, tears, saliva, CSF, what's that mean? Cerebral spinal fluid, cervical cells, any tissue. But again, what's more likely to cause exposure? Blood. That's the most likely mixing that creates you to now develop HIV. What if I stick a patient with a needle and then I stick myself? That's one of the things that now I can say, I can draw blood from that patient and see if they have HIV because I potentially am infected from hepatitis, HIV, whatever they have. So is there a very, very high likely that if I stick myself from a needle, not very high, it's a very small percentage, but I would wanna know so I could get treatment. So again, if you ever stick yourself, fill out an incident report, and make sure you get that patient tested to protect your own self from developing anything the patient might have. Um, anybody that's pregnant should be screened for HIV. Why? Because it can pass it right on to the baby. Okay, what's more likely to happen? What are we going to do? C-section for that baby. We're not going to recommend they breastfeed because the less mixing and the less contamination with those body fluids, the better off we're going to be. Again, it has a couple different stages. Here's the stages based off of that T cell count we just talked about. Uh, again, what we're looking at in the beginning, this the T cell count could be you know okay. As we progress, the T cell count drops down because the patient does is losing their immunity to this disease. And now, once we get into stage three, we call it AIDS, which is the, the syndrome that happens. One and two, they just have the virus in their body. Okay. Stage three, they've now developed AIDS. 
And again, their T cell count is less than 200. And now those are the things that are going to happen. We're going to get candidas. What's that? A yeast disinfection. We're going to get herpes suspects, sores around their mouth. There's something called HIV related encephalopathy. What the heck does that mean? Brain. Patient's brain. And they have symptoms of confusion and lethargy and seizures, and those things can cause a patient to die. There's a Kaposi sarcoma, that's the lung cancer that they many times develop. They can get tuberculosis anywhere, they get pneumonia, they have wasting syndrome. What does that mean? They're dehydrated, they're malnourished, right? They have malnutrition. They're all the things in that stage three that end up killing the patient. So we gotta try to keep their T count um, within normal limits as good as we can and try to keep it up. Anybody with HIV, if they're followed by a doctor, will go and get blood work and they'll see what their T cell count is and their B cell count and be able to tell, is your body responding to the meds that we're giving you? Are you able to fight off this virus? Are you progressing worse and worse into the stage three where you have AIDS? So what's our risk factors for developing HIV? Unprotected sex, very first risk factor. Sharing of needles, that's a big risk factor now, right? Because nobody out there that's on the street doing drugs worries about if their needles clean or not. So when you're born, you have to go, if your parents have it, and then you're born, like, it's HIV, or... You may not even have it. You don't necessarily have, the baby does not 100% have it. Well, is there ever a baby born with AIDS? No. No, they'll have HIV and then they're about, again, they have a weakened immune system when they're born, babies do anyway. Will they, they'll just have the virus in their body. They're rarely, rare. I haven't heard of many babies born with the active disease. Mm -hmm. Mostly they just test positive for HIV, but now they have to be monitored the rest of their life because the virus is not gonna go away. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to prevent with that C-section is that you even pick up the virus to start with. Because the baby is in your belly, do they have to 100% get the virus? No. No. So here, here's our risk factors. Unprotected sex, multiple sex partners. What does that mean? Like I told you, everybody sleeping around. Everybody else. Occupational exposure. There's your person that's out in the community working around blood and body fluids. Who could that be? A phlebotomist, a nurse, a doctor, anybody working in a lab dealing with blood every day. Aren't they at risk for contracting any of these things? Yes, because their occupation says they're around these fluids. Perinatal exposure means the baby potentially being exposed to the mom. Blood transfusions, not so much anymore because after 19, I think it was 88 or 80 something, they're much screened much more significantly now. IV drug use with a contaminated women, well, needle, older adult women, again, will be more susceptible when they are having sex with uh, unprotected sex. It's just a fact. So here's the things that are basically puts us at risk for developing HIV. The main two things, drug use and unprotected sex. They're the main two things that put you in that category. And usually when somebody has HIV and you look back at their medical history, one of those two things is usually in. Okay, so we're collecting data on the risk factors. We're monitoring the neurostatus. We're checking their lung sounds. We're providing skin care. What's our teaching? Safe sex practices. But now they're carrying the virus. It doesn't go away. Infection control for that patient. Okay, nurses collecting data from the client to identify risk factor for HIV. Select all that apply. Perinatal exposure, yes. The fact that they're pregnant, does that put them at risk? No. No. It doesn't really have anything to do with it. It doesn't say anything about the baby. It just says that the mom's pregnant. Is that a risk factor? No. Don't say, well, she had had sex. Right? For 20 years, right? So don't just because she's pregnant doesn't mean it was unprotected sex. Monogamous sex partner, what does that mean? Only, only, one. only one. Monogamous is one person. So does that put you at risk? No. 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 
multiple sex partners for children. Old adult woman, yes. Occupational yeah. yeah. exposure, yeah. yes. Yeah. So the only thing that's not in our risk factor there, um, two things, monogamous yeah. sex partner and pregnancy. Okay. Okay, so that helps you. Yeah, we won't talk about gout yet. We'll talk about that tomorrow. We'll go over gout, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, all the all those other things tomorrow. So the next exam is on immune and skin. Yep. Immune and skin. We're talking about rheumatoid arthritis again. We're talking about gout. That's all in here. We're talking about different types of cancer and signs and symptoms of cancer. General princi principles of cancer and then chemotherapy. So that test is not for a couple weeks. We'll get through most of it tomorrow and then probably the rest of it Monday. You have a skin packet to work on, right? Yeah. You have the immune packet to work on. Yeah. Okay, the people that did not get a 75, I'm going to send you what your assignment is for endocrine. There's an immune package too. Yeah, it's in Schoology. Oh, yeah. So these packets are not as long as the endocrine ones. But don't think that the, it's not just as important. Go through these chapters in the book. Make yourself some notes on immune disorder. Make yourself some notes on when it's recommended to get this vaccine or that vaccine. Make yourself some notes on general principles of cancer. That's what's going to be on the next test. Skin, there'll be some questions, but don't, I would not spend days and days studying skin, okay? NCLEX is not going to, like, it's going to be pretty straightforward with skin disorders. I may ask you questions about, like, burns and... Mm -hmm. Burns are important on cuts. Yeah. All right, everybody good? Yeah. So what do you think I'm going to send you right now in ATI?